coming to the end of this series. Today is our final sermon that is built within the series that we have entitled Foundations. That video has traveled with us all these weeks to help give uh, just a, a good entry into it, to remind us what is the, what's our desire with what we have been doing. If you've not been with us up until today, the sermon series that we've entitled Foundations has been an attempt to give attention to and explore the depths of the doctrines of this church, the doctrines of faith, Christian fellowship, and what that represents as far as the doctrines of our faith as believers in Jesus Christ, which we hope are one and the same. Uh, the doctrines of the Christian faith that has been handed down to us by generations, and now what we hold as well. Uh, there have been some things within these doctrines that we've, we've taught as essential. Uh, certainly the name foundations gives the idea that they are critical issues, uh, some more specifically critical than others, some that we mu just must agree to as we come and go as believers in Jesus Christ. They are essentials. They are non-negotiables within our faith. Others have been the teaching doctrine of this church, which might be different than your own experiences or than other brothers and sisters that we know in Christ. Absolutely destined for heaven and eternity spent with our Heavenly Father, but different belief, different, um, different ways of viewing. And some of those doctrines that we've shared over the last several weeks have fallen into that, ca that category. We felt that it was still equally important that we, you know the teaching doctrine of this church. And that's been the desire that we have given to this. The video has always given an allusion to, it was a, a message that uh, Pastor Kyle gave us back in September, early, or late September, on, uh, out of the passage of Matthew chapter 7. The video described it, that of being of the two builders that Jesus referred to. One, a wise builder who built his house upon the rock, and in doing so found it to be able to withstand the storms that come and, uh, and held because of that foundation of rock. And the other was a foolish builder, one who built his house on shifting sand on the ground that is unstable. And so therefore, when storms come, that house could not stand. One was wise and one was foolish. And Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, he who who builds his life essentially on my words and obeys my words. His life is an expression of obedience to my word. He will be like that wise builder who builds his house upon the rock. And sadly, some that we know are choose the other, and that's, that's the difference. And so that's been our core passage. I want to give a lot of commendation and gratitude to Pastor Kyle, who was really the architect of this series. Uh, the reason I say that is because today's doctrine is our final doctrine, uh, but it actually draws us back up near the beginning. And the reason why is because it's a tremendous transition from a very deep and theological series that we've been in, the foundation series, but we are at what? December 20th, five days away from one of the most celebrated holidays in our culture and certainly for us as believers in, in Jesus Christ. And so this transition is really, I commend him for, for seeing that and foreshadowing that, so that as we come today, uh, it has both the conclusion of our Foundations series as well as a, as a foreshadowing end to the celebration that we have later this week of the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And draw your attention, if you would like, to up to the screen. The doctrine that we're looking at today is the third doctrine of our Faith Christian Fellowship doctrinal statement. It's the third one that you would find. We've, we've provided them in physical form each time out here in the lobby, as well as if you were scrolling through a, a church website like ours and you would want to know, what are the beliefs of this church? Well, there is a doctrinal page. There is a beliefs page out of which this comes. And the third one that is listed is the person of Jesus Christ, his preexistence, his deity, and his incarnation. And it reads this, we believe that Jesus Christ ever existed with the Father and Holy Spirit, and that in his incarnation was begotten by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, and is true God and true man. And that's what we're going to look at today, the person of Jesus Christ. Several weeks ago, uh, Pastor Kyle, I think was actually the teaching pastor for that morning, talked about the work of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, 
resurrection and ultimate ascension to be alongside at the right hand of his father in heaven. He talked about that, and there are really two very critical aspects of Jesus Christ. That's his work, what, what Pastor Kyle talked about, and his person. And that's what we're going to look at today, the person of Jesus Christ. And it speaks very specifically to our Christmas celebration. So it's a wonderful bridge from a very deep theological sermon series into an enjoyable celebration of the birth of our Savior. I provided for you a little bit of a chart to help you understand what I think is important about, about the person of Jesus Christ. You can look up here on the screen. The three elements that were included in that statement were this, his preexistence, his deity, and his incarnation. I simplify that in this way. His preexistence and his deity are somewhat uh, close cousins. They are related. His preexistence, that which it was, it, he preexisted before his birth, as we know him as Jesus of Nazareth, his preexistence was one of eternity. And in that, it is related very closely to the idea of him being God himself, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The other half of that is his incarnation, his arrival as Jesus of Nazareth. The word became flesh, we'll talk about in just a moment, this idea. If you were to divide or simplify it a little further, it would be this, that because of these two things, Jesus is both fully God and fully man. The doctrinal statement said true God and true man, another appropriate way to describe it. That Jesus in his person is 100% God. Nothing lost in him, nothing absent in the Godhead, in the person of Jesus Christ. He is fully true God, 100%. But at the same time, again, mathematics, we set aside for the moment. At the same time, fully man, the incarnation, that he became in every sense human. Sometimes we get very fearful of that. What does that mean? And we're going to talk about that a little bit this morning that he was both fully God and at the same time fully man in every sense. These passages that we're going to look at come directly out of John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. That speaks of his deity, his preexistence, that he is the eternal Son of God, second person of the Trinity. And then John chapter 1, verses 14 to 18, speak to that sense of his humanity, that he was fully man in the incarnation in his arrival. Many of the songs that we just sung speaking to that reality that he came and was like us. So these are the, this is what we're going to do. I invite you, if you have a copy of God's Word, to turn to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. I'm actually going to read verses 1 to 18, and we will focus in on just a few of these critical verses in the teaching time, but I want, to read it, want us to read it together. So if you would stand with me, if you have a copy of God's Word, I'll be reading out of the New American Standard Version, out of the New American Standard Bible. I'm going to read. You may follow along on your, in your copy of God's Word or on a device on which it, you find it. John chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He was as a witness to testify. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light, which, coming into the world, enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, 
nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. Glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He comes, he who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. For of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time, the only begotten God, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come today to dive ever deeper into the person of your Son, our Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. Lord, may today be that bridge, as I've just shared, from the rich traditions of our, of our doctrines of the faith, the person of Jesus Christ and our exploration of that truth, who he is, may it also allow us to drive headfirst into the Christmas season with excitement and celebration, knowing that the birth of this small child that we celebrate that happened 2,000 years ago was the most significant event alongside of his death and his resurrection, Lord, but his arrival on this earth, that we realize that now we have found God in the flesh, God with us, Emmanuel. Lord, we pray that today would be an honor of that truth. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. In 1995, the great, uh, made to the top 10 charts, the great philosopher Joan Osborne gave us the song, One of Us. If you remember in a very folksy way, if you're at all turning through the pop radio stations back in the mid-90s, Joan Osborne ushered us into this question, what if God was one of us? In a very folksy way, a, a tune catcher, rising to the charts, very popular among, um, among our friends. What if God was one of us, a slob like one of us? What a deep question she asked, written by another, another poet that she brought to music and brought to pop culture. What if God was one of us, a slob like one of us. Obviously, we, I don't know the spiritual condition of Joan Osborne or the writer, of, the writer of that poem that she put to music. I don't know of their spiritual condition, but every now and then you find people who stumble upon a question that is deeper than they even realize. Whether in or outside the faith, questions are stumbled upon and we realize it's so much deeper than probably anticipated. In John chapter one, this is the apostle John. He refers in the passage, in the, in the verses, in the passage that we just read, he refers to another John. Could be confusing. John the apostle is the writer of this book that we're reading, that we're reading out of. John the Baptist was the one to whom he, he was referring. But John the Apostle is the writer. What I love about John, if you've spent any time in God's Word, he has a number of books that we attribute to his authorship. John's Gospel, this one. First and second and third John, the short letters that come near the end of our Bibles. And the very final book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. What's beautiful about John and his writing, the Apostle we believe to be him, What's beautiful about his writing is he, is he gives us in some of the most simple ways why I am writing what I'm writing. Take, for instance, in the book of Revelation, the Apocalypse, one of the most challenging books for any of us to dive into and understand all that John experienced in the Revelation, the things that must come, the things that will come. And he goes through all of that, but you know why he says he wrote? He gives us a purpose statement. Unlike many other writers of the entire scripture, Old or New Testament, he gives us a very simple purpose statement. I write these things so that you might be blessed. 
in reading them. Isn't that amazing to take a book that it so clouds our thinking and, we, and we, we fight our way through it to understand what he's writing, that he's actually saying, I wrote the things of Revelation. I wrote those things that you might be happy, blessed. Isn't that a, an amazing thing? Well, he does the same thing for us in the gospel that he wrote, the stories of Jesus himself. For just a moment, I invite you to turn to the end of John, uh, almost to the end of John in, in chapter 20. In two verses, he does the same thing with this book that he did with, like with Revelation. Why do I write this? That you might be blessed. That in reading these words, you might be blessed. Well, he does a very similar thing in his gospel, what we're looking at today. I read from verses 30 and 31 of chapter 20 of John, the gospel. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. People, you have no idea the things that I could have described about this man, Jesus. There are volumes and volumes that could have been written about him. But he says, these things I have written, in, which are the things which are not in this book, but these things have been written so that What? You may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing, you may have life in his name. So simple. When you read the book of John, and granted, this comes at the end, I believe the, the purpose statement of Revelation actually comes in the beginning. But the purpose statement of this book comes at the end of John, of this writing. So as you come to understand that, then you go back to the beginning, which we're going to do in just a moment. You go back to the beginning, to John chapter 1, and you, you throughout must keep that purpose statement in mind. You're given a privilege by John to know, why is it that I am writing this? All these things I could have, I'm getting to the end of it, and I'm telling you, I'm writing these last few words down, and I'm saying, I could have written so many other things about this man, but the things that I have chosen to write, to write the things that I have put on these pages are there because I want you to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So turn back again, if you would, to John chapter 1, what we're going to spend our time with mostly today. Remember, so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. Well, there are two aspects of his personhood, what I just showed you a few moments ago on those charts. This baby that we celebrate in a few days, the birth of this child 2,000 years ago, that for, for probably for many of us, every year of our life, we continually come back to and we revisit this beautiful story. Do we realize the reality of what we celebrate? that a small child was the expression of God in fullness while at the same time relatable to each and every one of us completely, fully God and fully man. His deity is that which is dealt with first. In John chapter 1, I read once again these three first verses, 1 to 3. In the beginning was the word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. His preexistence speaks to his deity. They are, they are related, and they complement one another in his deity. The, his deity is, is given expression in the fact that he existed before time before the idea of uh, what we know as the beginning. There's very little doubt that, that John was used similar phraseology for a reason. What does that sound like? In the beginning, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. And John borrows what, what feels very naturally, borrows from that phrase, and he brings it into his writing, and he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
there's any question about this idea of word, it's, it's cryptic, right? It's questionable. What is, who is he really talking about? Can we, can we be assured that he is talking about this man, Jesus, the word? Well, there are, there are really three traditions that probably John is tying together all in one. And they come from the translations of Scripture. If, if you know that o- the Old Testament was written in the language of Hebrew originally. It was the Hebrew Bible. That's its language. It was also written, later, translated into the language of Greek. We know it if you've ever heard this big word thrown around of the Septuagint. It's the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible the Old Testament. So you have it in Hebrew. You have a version of it in Greek. You also have a version of it called the Targums. It's the Aramaic translation of the Old Testament. What is Aramaic? Aramaic is probably the language that Jesus used throughout all of his ministry here on earth. It was the common language. See, Hebrew is traditional So he would have known and practiced Hebrew. He probably would have at moments in the temple or in the synagogue, excuse me, he would have spoken Hebrew and read the scrolls from Hebrew, possibly. Greek was a later translation of the Old Testament. And then there are the Targums, as I said, the Aramaic. Well, Jesus probably spoke more than anything else. He probably spoke Aramaic. It was a common language. Hebrew was traditional, Greek was formal, and Aramaic was common. It would have been what we might speak to one another comfortably and somewhat casually. That would be Aramaic. In all of those traditions, the word, word, in Greek, we know it to be logos. It's probably our most familiar, our most familiar translation, logos, word. But in all three, it had significance. To the Hebrews, word meant self-revelation. It meant divine revelation. It's the expression of the very divine personality. When God created the heavens and the earth, what did he do? He spoke these things. He spoke. It was his divine personality revealed. For the Greeks, word is the, the word, word, is that of the mind, of rationale, of reason. It's very possible that John, and then in the Targums, every time or nearly every time you see the word God, in our English translation, the Targums would have translated that in Aramaic, word. God would have been translated more often than anything else, word, in Aramaic in the Old Testament. So you can see that John may very well have been pulling from all three traditions in a unique but perfect way inspired by the Holy Spirit as he wrote these words. That if you were a Greek, it meant something to you. If you were deeply Hebrew, it meant something to you. And if you were just a common man using Aramaic, it meant something to you. Oh, word, that's, that's from the Old Testament. I see Translated for God. Well, the question is, in some ways, well, who is this? Jesus' name is not specifically mentioned here in these early verses. Uh, He's described in many different ways, right? We just read it several minutes ago. He's the light, and he's life, and he's the word. These, These concepts are thrown out, but one thing that is not mentioned is Jesus as of yet. So we're left to try and really dig deep into it and go, is that who he is speaking of? And the word became flesh. That's our indication in part that in fact he was the one spoken of. In verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So when we read in the first verses, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. We'll talk about it towards the end here. We'll talk about the implications that he is fully God. We could go, for us, what does it mean? We could go to several passages. One I invite you to do, we could go to Colossians 1 or 2. 
We could go to Philippians 2, but I want you to turn just as another example to Hebrews. It's near the end of your Bible. Turn to the right almost the whole way. Hebrews chapter 1 makes this really wonderful connection to this idea of the word being the self, the, the, the express, the divine personality on display. Hebrews 1 chapter, chapter 1 verse 3 says this, and he is the radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. Before that, it says in the first two verses, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets, in many portions and in many ways, in these last days he has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. And then he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature. From eternity past, the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, has existed alongside the Father and the Holy Spirit forever. He was in the beginning. There wasn't a time when he was not. He always existed eternally, the second person of the Trinity. And it was through him all the more as John chapter 1, if you jump back to that, as John chapter 1 describes that all things were made. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. He was the conduit through which all things were created. He was uncreated, and he was the conduit through which the Father created all things. He was God fully, who was now in the flesh. Do you know that uh, the struggle with the two natures of Christ, which is what we're talking about, the two natures, fully God and fully man, two natures, that that has been a, the it's probably the most debated doctrine of the Christian faith, more than the Trinity, more than any other doctrine in 2,000 years, the doctrine of the two natures of Jesus Christ has been more debated than any other and what's fascinating is that in the last 500 years, which that sounds like a long time, but in the comparison of the 2,000 years, in the last more recent, obviously, in the last 500 years, the dilemma has been his deity. It comes in with the Renaissance. It comes in with the age of reason. The idea being that the supernatural has now been surrendered to the natural. The natural is now what we find as more valuable. The supernatural is unknowable if it exists at all. There is nothing to really rely on in the supernatural. And so in the last 500 years, we are products of the challenge of Jesus' deity. We are products of that. The challenge to think, if, if you think about going out and speaking among friends or or just n knowing the, the arguments that are out there about our Christian faith from those on the outside and would be throwing rocks at, at our belief system, our faith. The issue is his deity, not his humanity. People love Jesus in his humanity. They love him. Oh man, he is good stuff. He's like chicken soup for the soul, right? In his humanity. We love his humanity, we meaning society in general. We don't have an argument with that. People love Jesus. But because he is only human to folks like that, he is manipulatable. He is fully manipulatable. Because he's human, you can do with him what you want. He was a man, he was a prophet, he was a good teacher. He was a sage, a philosopher. He was kind, he was gentle. All of those things are true. But if he is only human, you can take and tear that apart just like we do with one another. I'll take a part of you and I'll leave another part behind, the part that I don't like. 
We love Jesus' humanity. We are products of the last 500 years of the supernatural being surrendered entirely, if not even completely done away with for the natural. And it's been a progression. 500 years ago, it might not have been a strong challenge. 500 years later, we can't hardly make a statement of the deity of our Savior. But do you know that in the first 1,500 years, it was the exact opposite? In the first 1,500 years, especially in the years immediately following Jesus' life, in the age of the disciples, the apostles, and then the church fathers, and and all of the early theologians who had nothing other than the Old Testament and its revelation about Jesus Christ, and gradually letters starting to be circulated, which we know today as the New Testament, they didn't have commentaries. They created the commentaries. And you know that it was the exact opposite. They affirmed Jesus' deity. That was not nearly the difficulty. You know the challenge was? His humanity. What does it mean? For hundreds of years, they wrestled with the idea that God, which they had a much easier time believing that Jesus was in fact, God became man. They struggled with that. All sorts of heresies grew up out of this idea that God, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus, God's Son, was fully human. What does that even mean? Look with me, if you would, at John chapter 1, jumping down to verse 14. We struggle with John 1, 1 to 3, that he was God, preexistent, eternally existing as the second person of the Trinity. We struggle with that. We are products of the last 500 years. Our predecessors of 1,500 and 2,000 years ago struggled with this. I read for you. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. What on earth does that mean? Back in the 80s and the 90s and even the 2000s and now here where we find ourselves, there's been a series of movies, many of you may have no desire to see them, and I'm totally good with that, known as The Terminator, (laughs) Arnold Schwarzenegger, where he rose to fame. The Terminator. The idea behind The Terminator was was a completely robotic warrior that placed a thin layer of skin over top. What an interesting thought to have that movie in the last generation of our lives that that was actually a, not the, the warrior, the robotic warrior, but the idea that God came to earth and may, in order for him to maintain all of his deity, which again, early, our early fathers were struggling less with than we do, to maintain all of that, all of the truth of his, all of his Godhead, that he was a full member, undivided in any sense, 100% God, in order for that to be true, how on earth could he be fully human? And so there were heresies that were to that very point that God simply put on a layer of flesh and he was shielded from us in all of it. Go to Matthew chapter 17 in the transfiguration. The idea that Peter, James, and John witnessed this, this something of the, of the peeling away as though, as though there were slices in him and radiance began to, to blow out from, from underneath him. And they were terrified. They watched in a very unique experience. The one time they really saw it was the fullness of God peeking its way through, peering its way through so the early theologians and our, our predecessors, those who, who loved and were, were, were combing through the scriptures to understand what does it mean, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We might not think of that as being so difficult. Again, ours is a different struggle. But theirs was trying to wrestle with what does that even mean? Did he have a, did he have a fleshly heart? Did he have... Did he have lungs and a stomach and intestines? The Bible speaks very clearly. Jesus was 
hungry. He was thirsty. He was tired. He shed blood, real, live blood. And one of my favorites is I've had the honor of of doing just a few funerals and memorials. And one of the passages that I go to in those moments is John chapter 11. Our Savior wept. He wept. I go that a lot of times when people are grieving the loss of a loved one. And to imagine, do you realize that when he confronts Mary and Martha after the death of their brother, their beloved brother, that Jesus himself loved deeply. And he's now beginning to decay and smell in a tomb. And Jesus knows all along what he is going to do. He's going to bring Lazarus back to life for a time. But Mary and Martha are grieved. And he says, Mary, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. And they said, we, of course we know that. There will come a day when, when all will be raised in, in, in God, that God will graciously raise us from the dead. It says in John eleven thirty five, 35, the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. He had emotions. He had feeling. He, he hurt. He was tired. You see, we sometimes think that temptation is sin. We lose sight of the fact that temptation is not sin. You see, Jesus can relate to us in every way, in every single way, minus one, that he was without sin. But what does that really mean? Does that mean that he's not like us in every way? You just described that he's not, you said he's like us in every way, and all of a sudden you're saying, uh, except for one, he was without sin. Well, I'm here to tell you, that's a big deal right? So how am I really like Jesus? You are like him in this. I am like him in this, that in every way he was tempted just as we are, and yet he was without sin. What does that mean? Was he still like me then? No question about it. And here's the difference. We think temptation is sin. Jesus was tempted. When we are confronted with a decision that is before us, Jesus was confronted with the exact same decisions. There is nothing that we face that Jesus did not face. But here's the difference. Every single time he was presented with an option. That's what temptation is, right? It's options. I am tempted. Doesn't even have to be in sin. I am tempted. I'm presented with an option and I'm tempted to choose one over another. That's what temptation is. It's not sin in it. So Jesus is presented with options. And in Jesus' case, you know what he did? Every time he chose his father. That's the difference. Every time he chose his father. For us, we are tempted just like Jesus was tempted. And often we choose not the Father. That's the difference. We are given the same opportunity. In Christ, we are given the same opportunity. We can choose the right or we can choose the left in Christ. And sometimes, by his grace, we choose the right. We choose the Father. And in doing so, we reflect our trust and our belief in his Son. And there are many, many times we know it well where we choose other. Jesus didn't. Every single time he was presented with that option, he chose the Father. And hence, he was without sin. But in all respects, the Bible says, Jesus can relate to us. He can relate. I want you to crack... your Bibles on these pages that are, I'm going to hear them break right now. I want you to turn to Leviticus chapter 25. (laughs) Let's just listen as these pages are cracked open. The series that preceded Foundations, which now seems like an eternity ago, the series that preceded it was epic. 
It was the conversations that Pastor Kyle, Pastor Brian, a few other that talked about those Old Testament stories that pushed us forward into, into Christ. And one of those, I think Kyle was actually the, 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 the teaching pastor for the morning, was the story of Ruth and the story of Boaz. Bo, Ruth was that woman who was in distress, her husband gone, now she's living with her mother-in-law. She's not an Israelite, she's actually an outsider, a Moabite, and, and she has no access to anything of God except by faith through the Israelite people, through the Hebrew people. And they're empty, they're, they're helpless, they are widows. And there's a man named Boaz that gives us the type, a type of Christ because he is called her kinsman redeemer. He's her close relative that is by design able to redeem her emptiness and her brokenness, her poverty. He, is, he has the right to do it because he is properly close to her. I want you to look at Leviticus chapter 25. In verse 25, it says, these are the instructions on what it means to redeem. These are the instructions. It says in verse 25, if a fellow countryman of yours becomes so poor He has to sell part of his property. Then the nearest kinsman is to come and buy back what his relative has sold. These are the instructions. They're so poor that they have to sell what they, all that they have, even themselves at times, because that's the only payment they can even offer is their own person. The one who can redeem it, the nearest kinsman is to come and buy back what his relative has sold. Jump down to verse 47 of the same chapter. Now if the means of a stranger or a sojourner with you become sufficient, and a countryman of yours becomes so poor with regard to him as to sell himself to a stranger who is sojourning with you, or to the descendants of a stranger's family, then he shall have redemption right after he has been sold. One of his brothers may redeem him. It took, there was a qualifying characteristic about whether I could redeem you in that tradition. Does that make sense? It had to be, if you remember to the story of Ruth, Boaz had to actually go to someone who was slightly closer to Ruth and Naomi. Before I can redeem you, I need to find out is the one who is closest to you, can he redeem you? And in that story, it's told, and this is what they're working off of, Leviticus chapter 25. I need to know, am I the right person? Maybe there's one ahead of me that is the one that should redeem you because he is closer to you. And so in Ruth's story, Boaz was not. Boaz was not the closest. And so Boaz went to the closer relative and he says, hey, um, Ruth and Naomi, they need us right now. We need to buy them back. We need to redeem them and give them what they are properly due in our tradition. Are you going to do it? You're closer. And what does that, what does that family member say? No, I won't. You may. And so it passed to Boaz. And Boaz, in beautiful faithfulness, redeemed Ruth and Naomi. He did his task as the kinsman redeemer. Do you know why I refer back to this? Leviticus breaking, breaking the seal of Leviticus. Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. He is buying us back. And to do so, he had to be close to us. He had to be one of us. And he qualifies because he was 100% like us. That's his connection. In our table, I kind of begin to wrap up with this. Ladies, if you would put it up on screen. The table that we had was the idea that what are the implications of this? His being fully God means this. He is able to bear the full penalty of of our sin. He is able to bear the full penalty of our sin. 
Only God can pay for what God demands. That's it. No one else can pay it. The history of the sacrifices of the Old Testament, Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, if we were to go and look at it right now, we won't for sake of time. The book of Hebrews tells us that while sacrifices were made, it wasn't the problem of the heart of the priest or the people all the time. There were times where they were completely um, unacceptable in their heart. The problem was is that the payment was not enough. It was the blood of a bull or a goat or another animal. And what God in his grace allowed was that that blood would do the very minimum that it could do, and that is roll the atonement for the future. That's all it could do. It could go no further than that. In his grace, God said, it cannot pay for the penalty of sin, but this is what I will allow it to do. I will allow it to postpone the punishment of sin. I will allow it to move it one more year and one more year and one more year. It will never pay for it, but it can postpone it. And then Hebrews, in the book of Hebrews, the author of Hebrews tells us, but Jesus, once and for all, has paid it. Never again, never again. On the cross, it was satisfied for eternity. Our past, our current, and our future sins paid. Nothing left. And only if Jesus is fully God is that payment satisfactory. He must be. But the other side is that he is fully man. And why is that important? Because he's able to represent humanity in obedience and death. He is able to represent us. If he was God with dermis and epidermis just laid over, but every bit of his inside and his will and all of his decisions and everything like that was easy because it was God. He never really faced temptation because he was always going to choose. It, it was impossible for him to choose otherwise. Jesus relates to us in every way. Father, take this cup from me, but not my will, but yours be done. In every way, he experienced what we experience. And he chose his father every time. And so because of that, he can represent us. He can die for me. Not only because he's God can he pay the sin penalty, but he can die for me because he is my representative, my substitutionary atoning sacrifice. If he didn't feel what I felt, if he didn't go through what I, did, went, what I go through, and if he didn't choose what I oftentimes don't choose, he chose God. And because he did, righteousness is now his story, and it becomes my story. Fully God and fully man. This Christmas season is dedicated to this reality. I know it's hard to think that we are... In a, in a doctrinal series, we're, we're coming to the end. This, this concludes it. Gordon, we are five days away from Christmas. Is this really where we are going to spend our Christmas? And I'm saying, you bet. This is where we are going to spend our Christmas conversation. That God the Son came as a child. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He walked among us. He was one of us. And because of that, we can celebrate joy to the world. Hark the herald angels sing, silent night, holy night. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We are in a season of Christmas. And Lord, may the depth of this doctrine of the person of Jesus Christ not uh, not be one that be, is an obstacle to the, the lighthearted and joyful expectation of, of the birth of our Savior. May it be the core of why we do it. Because you came in the flesh, fully God and fully man, to rescue us. Praise the name of our Savior Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen.